step through the doorway into the prehistoric garden here at our studio, it's like taking a trip back in time. We've got species of plants in this garden that were present when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and a few that are even a little bit older. Well, I'll try to tell you about this garden without getting scooped up and swept away by giant pterodactyls or pteranodons. Well, this is the second year for this garden, and it's really starting to come together. It's made up of mostly hardy perennial plants, and we've got a few plants that are tender they have to dig up and take inside for the winter. But all together, it's really starting to look lush and green. And I say green because there aren't a lot of flowers in this garden. It's made up of a lot of plants that reproduce by spores. So they don't have flowers, fruits, or seeds. One group of non-flowering, spore-producing plants are the ferns. And we have lots of fossil records that indicate ferns were present in great abundance in prehistoric times. It's not uncommon to find fossilized ferns throughout the world, even some here in Oklahoma. Got some little fossils of ferns in shale here. Would you believe that ancient ferns are right now making it possible for you to be watching Oklahoma gardening? The TV set that you're watching this on is powered by electricity. And if we think about the way electricity is produced here in Oklahoma, it's made by burning natural gas and by burning this stuff, coal. Coal is the compressed remains of ancient plants. And a lot of the plants that have supplied this source of carbon were ancient ferns. So in a roundabout way, we could say Oklahoma gardening is being brought to you today in part by ancient ferns. With their delicate texture, ferns are definitely beautiful additions to our gardens. They don't even have to produce flowers. Now you might be saying, okay, I've grown asparagus ferns before and I know I've seen flowers and fruits on these. Well, the truth is the asparagus fern is not really a fern at all. It's actually a member of the lily family. So sometimes we see the little lily-like white flowers on the asparagus fern, sometimes followed by the uh, little red-orange berry-like fruits. It's called asparagus fern because it's in the genus asparagus and the leaves are somewhat fern-like. Ferns are a very diverse group of plants. A lot of them have underground stems or rhizomes and they send up lots of these leaves that we typically call fronds. And if we look at the underside of a mature frond, we can see where the spores develop these little brown spots that are sometimes confused as insect eggs are the little clusters of spore cases called sori. The spore cases are called sporangia, but once they're mature and the spores are released, it's like a cloud of dust because a single frond or leaf of a fern can produce hundreds of thousands of spores. Well, once they are released, the spores will settle into a moist spot and they will germinate. And you would think they would grow into another fern, but they don't. They grow into something that looks sort of like this, a little heart-shaped piece of green fern tissue called a gametophyte or a prothallus. And this is the stage of the fern's life cycle where reproduction occurs. Uh, within the little prothallus on different parts of, of, of the structure are produced female reproductive parts and male reproductive parts. And once they are mature, the sperm will swim over to the eggs and will fertilize an egg, and an embryo will develop, and a fern plant will grow from that embryo. It'll start to grow, and as it gets larger, it will receive nutrients from this little piece of tissue, the prothallus. And once it gets to a certain size, this uh, prothallus will shrivel up and kind of go away. And the fern keeps growing, grows, produces those spores, and starts the whole process all over. Because the sperm has to swim over to the egg, water is required in order for ferns to reproduce. So that's why we see ferns usually growing in damp places or at least in areas that don't dry out very fast. Of the 12,000 species of ferns on our planet, 
about two thirds of them are native to the wet tropical areas where they flourish in the moist environment. Although there are a few species of ferns that grow in deserts, the so-called desert ferns, where they're found growing in the shelter of rocks. Of the many fern species in the world, there are several that we use as ornamentals. Our 2003 Oklahoma proven perennial is a fern. That's the Japanese painted fern that we've got right here. I really like this fern. It's a very tough fern. The foliage has unique coloration. We get kind of some silvery patterns on these fronds or leaflets. And the new leaves, when they emerge, even get this pink or kind of purple raspberry type color on the newly emerging leaves or fronds. Right back here we have a holly fern and you can see it's not finely dissected as some of the other ferns are. This is a new new leaf so it's a little bit soft but as they get older they do stiffen up a little bit uh, kind of like the leaves of hollies. Now these aren't going to be winter hardy in Oklahoma every year especially in the northern part of the state. They can freeze out if we have a very cold winter, but if they're in a protected spot, you can enjoy them for several years. Right back here, we have a southern wood fern. It sometimes goes by the name of southern shield fern, and you can see it's a dark green fern. It's a little bit taller than some of these others. These are native to subtropical areas around the world, and we see these growing sometimes in Texas and other southern states. Well, right back here by the gate, we've got another fern that's quite a bit taller than some of the others. This is a cinnamon fern, and you can see the soft texture of, of, of its foliage rising above several of these other ferns here. This fern is part of a group of ferns known as the royal ferns, or the genus Osmunda. And it's called cinnamon fern because when the new fronds are coming out, they're covered with hairs that are sort of a cinnamon color. One thing that I really like about this fern is that these can actually be found growing native in eastern parts of Oklahoma. Right down here, we have the autumn fern. And it's another Asian species like the Japanese painted fern. And you can see it's got very broad, twice or three times divided leaves or fronds and the neat thing about the autumn fern is that the new foliage has this beautiful bronze or copper color. In the fall we have some cool weather and we get a few new fronds growing from these and it's just perfectly named giving us these autumn colors in the cool weather of fall, the autumn fern. Well as you can see there's quite a bit of diversity even among these hardy ferns from temperate climates, but once we get to the tropics, we can get some ferns that really start looking unique, like the staghorn fern we've got right here. There are several species of staghorn ferns. Some have fronds that are, that are wider even than these. Uh, some of the more finely dissected staghorn ferns are sometimes called elkhorn ferns, but a very unique fern from the tropics. Well, from tropical parts of Australia and New Zealand, we get tree ferns. We've got one here in the corner of our prehistoric garden. And this is not hardy here in Oklahoma. This is one that we dig up and take indoors in the winter and then bring back outside. But it does have a very well-defined trunk down here. And where these grow, native in Australia and New Zealand, they can sometimes reach heights of 60 feet and they can have these giant fronds that stretch out 15 feet long. So that's a canopy of about 30 feet, a 60 foot tall fern with a 30 foot canopy, quite impressive. The trunks of the tree fern are also rot resistant, so where these are abundant, they've actually been used to line roads and even construct small buildings. The new fern leaves or the newly unfurling fronds of lots of ferns are called fiddle necks and if you look right down here at this large fiddle neck of the tree fern you can kind of see why they're called the the fiddle necks as they as they unfurl sort of looks like the neck of a fiddle and you can also get a good glimpse of all the little hairs that protect these fronds 
to these new leaves as they unfurl. In addition to the ferns, there are other spore-producing plants known as fern allies. Some examples are the mosses, liverworts, club mosses, and this plant, the horsetail, or equisetum as it's known botanically. Another common name is scouring rush. But it's a very interesting looking plant. It looks like a clump of green pencils. The plants don't really have leaves. The green stems are where photosynthesis takes place. These stems are quite unique as well. They're very segmented, as you can see here, and they're hollow, and they're very rough or coarse when you feel of them. The plants are very rough because they accumulate silica from the soil and deposit it in the stem to discourage anything from wanting to eat it. Uh, if an animal took a bite of this, they may think they're eating something like stringy sand or something like that. But the rough nature of the stem is also how the plant gets its common name. You can take these rough stems and bundle them up and use them to scrub or scour pots and pans to get them clean. They can also be used to sand wood and even polish metal. In Europe, this plant sometimes goes by the name of pewter plant because it's been used to polish pewter. Up at the top of some of the stems of the equisetum, we see a little cone-like structure. This is where the spores are produced. This is called the strobilus, and the spores react or behave pretty much the same way that the spores of the ferns do. They will uh, be dispersed, they germinate, they grow into a little piece of green tissue known as the gametophyte where reproduction takes place, and just like the fern, they have to have water to carry out their reproduction. So you may have seen these growing in wet places out in the wild in Oklahoma, as they're native to much of North America. If you ever want to grow the equisetum or horsetail, uh, you need to be warned that they spread quite aggressively. We planted these here in a little contained bed made out of a, a plastic or rubber liner, but they somehow have found some creases or holes and they've escaped and we've got, a, got them coming up in a number of places. I've actually seen this plant grow underneath a four foot wide sidewalk and come up on the other side. So probably the best way to grow the equisetum or horsetail is in a container. A little bit younger group of plants in the wonderfully created plant kingdom are the gymnosperms. And the word gymnosperm means naked seed, and it refers to the way the seeds are openly exposed within specialized structures, like for instance, pine cones. Plants that produce cones are known as conifers, and these include our pines, our spruces, our cedars, hemlocks, firs, and many others. Another gymnosperm is one of our unique shade trees, that's the ginkgo, and scientists sometimes debate on whether it is a true conifer or not, but it is for sure a gymnosperm. The ginkgo has survived for many years because it doesn't seem to have any serious pests. Hardly anything wants to feed on the ginkgo. So for this reason, the ginkgo biloba extract is sometimes marketed as a health food supplement. A group of primitive conifers, sometimes referred to as living fossils, are the cycads. And we've got a couple of species here in our prehistoric garden. These are sago palms, and just like the asparagus fern is not really a fern, a sago palm is not really a palm, it's an ancient conifer. These are native to Japan, and they aren't quite winter hardy enough to grow in Oklahoma. We sometimes see these growing in gardens down in Houston and the Galveston area, but it's a little bit too cold for them up here. So we dig these up every year and take them into the greenhouse for the winter. But they are wonderful additions to the garden. They're very graceful. They make excellent accent plants or container plants. These really large compound leaves can have up to 125 individual leaflets. 
And when these first come out as, as new leaves, they're very soft, but uh, once they become mature, they really harden up and actually become quite stiff. And if you back into one, you're certainly going to know it. Well, all cycads throughout the world are endangered, so they're protected. In fact, it's illegal to remove them from the wild. In some African countries, they've had such a problem with plant poaching or illegal wild collecting of cycads that the governments of some of these countries have resorted to putting computer chips embedded into the plants out in the wild. That way they can track them in case they're removed or stolen. Well, another cycad that we've got right over here is a species that we find in Mexico. This is the cardboard plant and it's got these interesting leaves that have a very coarse texture. They sort of look and feel like cardboard. Very unique, exotic plant. A uh, thing that's a little bit different about the cardboard plant from the sagos is that instead of above ground trunks, the cardboard plant's trunk is mostly underground. You just see sort of the tip of it right here with all these leaves coming out. There are several species of the cardboard plants in the genus Zamia. These are native to areas in Mexico, Central America, tropical South America, and there's even one that is native to Florida. Right over here on this cardboard plant, we can see one of these structures that lets us know it is a conifer. We can see the cone here, sort of like an elongated pine cone, but this is the reproductive part of the cardboard plant. Now, if you have small children around or pets that will eat anything, you may be more cautious around these plants because the seeds and cones of the cardboard plant can be toxic. Not a cycad, but a primitive living gymnal sperm is a Norfolk Island pine. This is one of our common house plants. These are sold sometimes around Christmas to be decorated like little Christmas trees. But these are native to Norfolk Island off the east coast of Australia, and they certainly do have that primitive or prehistoric look going for them. Well, there are a few families of flowering plants that have characteristics that are very primitive in their flowers or their structures. Right here I've got the fruit of a southern magnolia, and some of those primitive characteristics are the spiral arrangement of the stamens. Down here you can see all these little pits where the stamens have fallen away, but they are arranged in a spiral fashion. And another characteristic is the many simple pistils that have gone into making up this magnolia fruit. So you can almost see this sort of looks like a cone or some sort of pine cone. Well, one other plant family is the Ranunculaceae, and it has members such as the peonies, the clematis, the hellebores, and this plant, the anemone. This is one of the hybrid Japanese anemones. And on this flower right down here, you can see that there is a multitude of stamens with the little anther sacs here, but those are arranged in a spiral fashion. And right up here where a lot of the flower parts have fallen away, if you might have to take my word for it, but those anthers or those stamens were arranged in a spiral fashion. A lot of those have fallen away, so you kind of see that similar pitting on the magnolia fruit. And once again, there in the center are the multitude of simple pistils. So you get a little bit of similarity with these two, but the spiral arrangement of the stamens and the many simple pistils are primitive plant characteristics. The last plant I want to show you in this garden is in no way primitive, prehistoric, or ancient. This is the variegated ground ivy, or creeping charlie, and we're using it as a skin or a covering for our dinosaur. This is, of course, a brontosaurus, and the brontosaurus is a very friendly, plant-eating dinosaur. We don't have any of those mean, meat-eating dinosaurs lurking around our garden.